Valor, Honor, Compassion, Wisdom, Generosity. These are the five chivalric virtues revered by knights the world over. Any man can wield a sword, but what separates the common mercenary from the noble hero who gives his life for the good of the people? Mercenaries fight for gold, serving their own interests first and foremost. Knights, however, they fight for goodness and virtue. In the real world, these values are held throughout history as folklore and legend, with men such as King Arthur springing to mind. In the world of The Witcher, we see many parallels to our ancient legends, only these fantastical tales come to life before our eyes. When the Lady of the Lake, her arm clad in the purest shimmering samite, holds aloft a divine sword from the bosom of the water, only the most worthy knight, the very embodiment of the five chivalric virtues, may grip the weapon by the hilt and raise it skyward. And when we, the humble Witcher, find ourselves journeying through Toussaint, the fable-like land of chivalry incarnate, we will have a chance to take the sword from the fair lady, and in doing so we will be in possession of the best sword in all of the land, one that grows more powerful with use, and by level 100 will have stats unrivaled by any other sword. Hey guys, it's Drew here, and welcome back to my Witcher lore and mythology series. In this video I'm going to be telling you all about the strongest weapon in the game, how to get it, and how to use it to its maximum potential. But as is always the case in this series, I'll also tell you everything there is to know about the sword's backstory, the lore behind the characters we'll meet when obtaining it, and of course, all of the real-world mythology that goes along with this mystical quest. Typically for Geralt of Rivia, our adventure begins at the notice board, this time in the very centre of the beautiful bustling main square of Beauclair, the Grand Place. Now if you can draw your attention away from the masses of hawkers, merchants and pickpockets, averting your gaze from the diverse colourful displays and the sweet aromas assaulting your sinuses, you'll see a notice titled, Test Yourself with the Trials of the Virtues, and it says, Years pass and times change, yet all that is good and beautiful still requires a defender. Come to the Isle on Lac la Vie and test the rightness of your character during the trials. If you pass, you shall receive a reward. Geralt is no stranger to trials, and I think we can safely say he's quite good at them. So let's head to the lake, to the northwest of the city. On the calm waters of Lac la Vie, we may spy the odd fisherman sitting on the bank, or perhaps a deer grazing by the wild molly arrow flowers. But beyond that, the place is as still as a cemetery. It seems that even in a land so full of knights errant and glory seekers, there is one respite from the exuberance, and it prospers as a result. Who would have thought that the location of the most powerful sword in the world would be on land untrodden by knights and bandits alike? The notice spoke of the isle in the centre of the lake, so I guess we'll have to take a dip in the crystalline waters. The remote island is left completely in the hands of Mother Nature, and the greenery flourishes in the sunlight. The first thing we'll see on the beach is a rock formation. Five stone fingers prod the sky, and they each serve as tablets, with inscriptions carved into the smooth rock face. One monument for each of the five chivalric virtues. But we'll return to those soon, as something slightly more eye-catching waits beyond. Another body of water with another mound of earth sticking up from the surface. At this point you could say it's an island in a lake on an island in a lake. And knelt on the tiny island is a man in humble robes. The parabolic nature of this encounter would expect you to find some knight in pristine shining armour awaiting us. But here we are and this man looks like he's spent decades on the island. As we prepare to wet our boots once more, we'll discover that we can walk on the surface of the water, much to Geralt's seldom seen surprise. The hermit will reveal to us that he has in fact dwelt on this shore for time immemorial, and thus he can testify to the extraordinary nature of the lake. Beneath the water's surface a sword most wondrous lies, but it cannot be pried up by just anyone. In order to grasp the blade, one must possess the five chivalric virtues, and it is this hermit who passes judgement on the ones who come in search of it. To acquire the sword, we must prove to him we are worthy. The five stones feature inscriptions of the five virtues, and the hermit reveals that we may prove that these virtues dwell in our hearts during our time in Toussaint. So let's address each virtue individually. There are many ways to prove each virtue, but in the interest of time I'll give you the easiest examples. The first stone speaks of generosity, and it says, No man can be called good who does not share his prosperity with others. Generosity is required for dignity in life and peace in death. The easiest way to prove this is by paying the delivery boy five gold when he gives us Triss or Yen's note, after the first confrontation with Detlaf. Next comes Valor, and this stone says, 
Valor does not make one good, yet how many good men have you met in your life's journey who are cowards? Those who possess Valor do not hesitate to stand against the majority, no matter what the consequence is. To prove this virtue, I recommend completing the quest Warble of a Smitten Knight, electing to complete the tournament after speaking with Vivian. Then we have Compassion. There are many traits which bear witness to a man's true nature. Compassion is what separates men from beasts. Whoever feels sympathy for his fellow man will never turn a blind eye to misfortune. He will instead always stand in defense of the wronged. To achieve the virtue of sympathy and compassion, spare the Shale Mars life in the arena. The penultimate virtue is honor, and this stone claims that honor cannot be purchased. Honor also cannot be sold, for its value is greater than all the treasures in the world. Yet one can lose it, and whoever does so shall have sullied his name for all eternity. A truly honourable man always stands behind his actions, faces every challenge and refuses to lie. To prove this virtue, keep Vivian's secret from Guillaume in the same quest as Valor. Or for an alternative, the quest Father Knows Worst is nearby and very quick. Simply convince Hugo to spare his brothers. Finally, we have Wisdom. Wisdom is a virtue which one should strive to cultivate throughout one's life, for it's impossible to be so wise that one cannot become wiser. The wise knows this, as we journey through life, we should seek to make wise choices. Remember, wise choices are not those which make our lives easier or simpler. Often they make them more complicated, but always they make us better. Prove this virtue by guessing Milton's location correctly when pursuing the Beast of Beauclair. The correct answer is the greenhouse. And with these virtues proven, we may declare our chivalry before the humble hermit. But there is one final test before we can take the blade for ourselves. We must prove that we are masters by displaying our skills through combat atop the water's surface. What comes as a surprise is our contender. This old hermit who's been knelt on the hard turf for time immemorial gets to his feet. I almost expected him to ask for a hand as certainly this lake couldn't protect him from his inevitable arthritis. But here he stands, and through some kind of sorcery he encases us within a tidal barrier. His walking stick is actually a mage's staff, and he sends torrents of water flurrying towards us, eroding a hefty chunk of health. If that wasn't enough, he shrouds himself in a whirlpool, allowing him to teleport across the battlefield and even suck us into his vortex for serious damage. All the while, the legendary sword waits under our feet, illuminated in aquatic blue by marine magic. Victory will not come easily, but with the five chivalric virtues at our disposal, it feels as though fate is on our side. Gracious in defeat, the hermit will descend into the water, disappearing among the reeds. And then, the water ripples in the pinnacle of the pond, and breaking its surface rises a perfect blade, with bright amber runes etched into the silver, glowing like the coals of a smith's forge. And when we see the hilt, it is being held by the slender arm of a maiden. Behold your Arendite. Through the translucent water, the visage of a beautiful woman is as clear as day. Her elven accent, which resembles the Welsh accent of the real world, is significant in the lore and mythology behind this astonishing scene. But before we get into that, we heed her word, as the nymph's voice resonates in the air, uninhibited by the water. The Lady of the Lake, a fabled creature the Witcher has met before, and she says, Forget not that you are a man right and honourable, devoted to doing good, and for these reasons you receive the blade. Now bear it, and I trust this time you shall not lose it. And like the hermit, she returns to the depths, leaving the legendary sword to linger, defying gravity in the centre of the lake. The moment we grasp the weapon, reality snaps back into focus, after momentarily seceding to more mystical powers. There's much to talk about here, but first I'll address the weapon, for this is why we embarked on the journey in the first place. Arendite is a very unique silver sword, and it functions in a vastly different way to every other sword in the game. Firstly, Arendite does not have a set level, instead the sword scales with you, and you can realise its potential regardless of what level you are, and when you require it, this means that you can take the sword on your journey across into New Game Plus, levelling it as you go, and having it remain useful regardless of the foe. Arendite charges with every hit you land on an opponent, and it grows more powerful by 10% with each charge, maxing out at 10 charges. Taking damage or the passing of time will cause the sword to lose charges, but the most important thing about this system is that killing a foe with a fully charged sword will permanently increase the damage of the weapon, and you can increase its base damage by up to 10 points for every character level. In short, if used frequently and leveled with your player, you can reach level 100 with a sword that deals 1008 to 1232 damage. 
Without talking about weapon effects and glyphs, but simply base damage, this is the single strongest sword you can get. Gesheft, the sword you acquire from the bonfire in the Land of a Thousand Fables, comes very close to this, offering up to 1199 damage, but Arundite beats it in the end. And that's without talking about Arundite's insanely powerful charge mechanics. But what is the deal with this sword? How is it not rusted beyond repair from years spent beneath the surface of the lake? And this is the only time I can think of where we've been given a sword from a naked woman. Well, this story and the Lady of the Lake is inspired by the Arthurian legends of Britain. Everybody knows of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, but different folk tales tell different stories of where he got his sword Excalibur. Some tell of the sword being pulled from the stone, while others are even more steeped in mystery. In some such stories, usually of Welsh origin, Arthur and his wizard Merlin encounter the Lady of the Lake when his sword is damaged and he's gravely in need of a replacement. And then, as if by magic, she presents Excalibur from the bosom of the lake. Legends like these were often used to legitimise Arthur's claim to the throne of England. And I know what you're thinking, strange women lying in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government. Supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not some farcical aquatic ceremony. And that much is true in the Witcher world. Unlike Excalibur, Arundite is not given to a king, but it is given to a knight who displays the five sacred chivalric virtues. And that is very fitting considering the foundation of the Knights of the Round Table was one of chivalry. After establishing peace throughout Britain, King Arthur invited very distinguished men from far distant kingdoms to join his order, and their code of courtliness inspired a romantic perception of the knight order as one of nobility, fame, and honour. Starting to sound familiar, isn't it? These notions of knightly chivalry were written about extensively in Welsh folklore, and the Arran in Arundite is a Welsh name meaning battle. Much like the virtuous Arthur, who received Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake to form his chivalrous alliance, Geralt, who received Arundite from the Lady of the Lake, was bound to being right and honourable, devoted to doing good. And the last thing to cover is their history together. As we saw through Geralt's dialogue with the Lady of the Lake, this is not their first meeting. During the events of the first game, Geralt encountered the Lady on Black Turn Island, near the village of Murky Waters. After receiving a knighthood from the Lady, Geralt receives Arundite, and he wields it until the prologue of The Witcher 2 Assassin of Kings. He loses it in majestic fashion, thrusting it through the maw of the dragon Saskia. And since their first meeting in the Northern Kingdoms, it seems only fitting that the Lady of the Lake has found herself in the fable-like land of Toussaint, where chivalry rules the culture, and knights errant wander the region in search of glory. Before I leave you, I'll give you one warning. If you devote your earthly body to representing the five chivalric values, and the Lady of the Lake dons you with her favour, do not betray her trust. She may be breathtakingly beautiful, but she does not take kindly to men who forsake their sacred vows. Consequences of such betrayals can be seen the moment we catch glimpse of Beauclair for the first time, as a giant erupts in an avalanche of rubble from a windmill. Goliath the giant was once a knight, and when he violated his vows, the Lady of the Lake punished him, transforming him into this ignoble beast. His real name was Louis Alberni, and his crest showed a red field with a golden star, each of whose five points stood for one of the chivalric virtues. During his prime years, you can see why the Lady would have taken a liking to him, yet fame and glory went to Alberni's head. Years passed, and he began to think himself the most perfect of all knights. In the end, he came to think he was virtue incarnate, and there was no one in the world who preceded him in this regard, something even the Lady of the Lake must recognise. Alberni thus set off to see her, and have her pay him homage in honour of his excellency. Yet as Alberni approached the Lady's home, his body and equipment began to change. The slender knight grew more and more corpulent, until his horse could finally no longer bear him. His sword first became wooden, and then turned into a mace and his shining armour became dull and turned to ash. All he had left was his helmet, which turned into a wooden cage. Alberni stood on the shore of the lake, wishing to speak, yet all that came from his lips was a wild cry. The knight peered at his reflection in the lake's waters, and understood he had become a giant. The Lady of the Lake then emerged and said, You abandoned the chivalric virtues long ago. Of all your sins, the greatest was pride. It has changed your sword into a mace, deprived you of armour and made your flesh into that of a beast. From now on you shall be known as Goliath, 
Go to Mount Gorgon, where you shall live in this form far from the eyes of men, accompanied by the painful memory of your lost glory, until the day death mercifully frees you from your torment. Being the embodiment of the five chivalric virtues is no easy task. Fending off temptation, indulgence and sin at every turn is paramount to denying the imperfections of humanity. Geralt of all people knows this, as his experiences have driven him to many deeds he would later regret. But if you believe you are pure of heart and will do everything within your power to serve the forces of good, then take up Arendite and strike down your enemies. The greatest sword in the game is reserved for the noblest knight. And with that, I'll leave you. I hope you enjoyed this video, all about Arendite and the Lady of the Lake. If you did, a like would go a long way. Thank you so much for watching, I've been Drew, and I will see you in the next one.